Our next presentation is Personalizing the Grocery Shopping Experience with AI. Our speaker is Merrick Rosner, VP of Enterprise Sales for AppCard. Merrick, take it away. Thank you so much, and uh, good afternoon to everybody. Again, my name is Merrick Rosner. I'm the VP of Enterprise Sales here at AppCard. Uh, we are a personalized marketing and shopper analytics platform. Uh, we deal with many types of retailers uh, across the country and globally. Um, I happen to specialize uh, with the independent grocers, and we'll be gearing uh, a lot of my conversation to that today. Um, we are based out of New York City. We've got about 35 folks here, another 35 down in Florida, um, mostly from an acquisition we most recently made of ProLogic, which many of you may be uh, familiar with, as I know they've spoken at these conferences in the past, um, and another 25 or so folks in our Tel Aviv office, which is our uh, R&D. Um, as a company, we cover about 500 million transactions per year, um, about one in eight U.S. households have AppCard. Um, about 17 million shoppers have enrolled uh, onto our platform. We've got just about, it's actually closer to 4,000 merchants now using AppCard as their loyalty and rewards program, uh, and that's across the U.S., Japan, South and Central America, and Canada. Uh, we cover over 1,000 grocery store locations here in the U.S., um, and that's a bit of an overview on our company. So today, the topics that I'll be covering uh, are why personalization, bridging the gap between loyalty and personalized marketing, advanced shopper segmentation, and using AI to deliver the right message to the right shopper at the right time. Um, one key thing to understand before I move forward um, is who created AppCard. Um, and one of the folks uh, that you probably don't know him by name, but you'll certainly know some of the things he's done in the past is our CEO and co-founder, Yair Goldfinger. Uh, and Yair actually invented Instant Messenger. So if any of you have used AOL Instant Messenger or IM back in the day, that was his company called ICQ that he wrote the patent for and sold that to AOL and it became AOL Instant Messenger. Uh, and then he also invented and pioneered retargeting, remarketing. Uh, for those of you who don't know what that is, uh, if you go online and you, you go to homedepot.com and you're looking at a shovel, and then you go to ESPN.com uh, and are looking at the, you know, the score of your favorite team and that shovel is following you in the top right-hand corner, that spammy slash spooky slash incredibly effective marketing tool is called retargeting, and he invented that as well, a company called Datomi that he sold to ValueClick. Uh, and we are funded by Jerry Yang, founder of Yahoo, Peter Thiel, founder of PayPal, uh, Eric Schmidt, CEO, uh, Chairman of Google Now Alphabet, amongst many others. So without further ado, uh, I'm going to the whys of personalization and why that is the new expectation of today's consumer. So this is all about the data, collecting data on your shopper, understanding who they are as an individual and what their habits are, and ensuring that you're putting together a multi-channel personalized series of promotions, offers, and rewards that are developed specifically for that individual to drive new behavior. If you think about the expectations that we have today as consumers, I'll use Amazon as an example of someone that has trained us and created these expectations in our world. If you think about when I go shop online, I automatically look for customer reviews now. How many stars did it get? What was said about that product? If I think about the ease of one-click checkout, that's something I wasn't used to, but once I got trained to do it and had that experience, that was my new online shopping expectation. If I'm told that this recommendation was made just for me or that this item has often bought with these other three to five items, I'm now very familiar with that scenario during my path to purchase, during my checkout experience. I can talk to an Echo. I can speak to Alexa and have her order for me. I can click a dash button on my um, washer machine and get new, new ball of Tide delivered to my, my door. I can have anything delivered next day. I can now even explore having people come into my house and put my groceries away in my refrigerator. 
So these are all things that have been introduced to us over the past few years and have completely changed our expectations. And now the expectation of the shopper is for everything to get personalized. If we look at things such as coupon redemption rates, the key of course is personalization. Anytime a retailer sends out a mass coupon to everybody in their database, their redemption rate is extraordinarily low, 1% in many cases. When you compare that to when a personalized coupon is sent out, the redemption rate increases to 10 to 20% because now I'm sending the right offer to the right person based on their buying behavior. It also leads to them being less likely to opt out, more likely to redeem, more likely to share, and more likely, of course, inherently to become a loyal shopper. One of the things um, that we think about as a quote-unquote loyalty and rewards platform and provider, just because somebody takes a card or signs up for your program does not make them a loyal shopper. It requires that the retailer takes the time to understand who that shopper is, recognize their shopping behavior, and begin to cater their experience in-store, online, and at every touch point specifically for that shopper based on their personal preferences. And then and only then do you really have an opportunity to gain and build their true loyalty. Some of the things that you're going to want to do once you have these shoppers in your program is, of course, try to get shoppers into different levels. And I'll speak to that point in just a little bit in a little bit more detail. Uh, but once you start to really understand your customer cohorts or the types of shoppers that you have, putting in place very specific strategies and campaigns to drive those shoppers closer and closer to the behavior of your top shoppers. And with new shoppers altogether that have first joined your program or first entered your store, the key is creating a regular cadence of visits and creating that pattern of them continuing to come back to your store on a regular basis. Some interesting stats that I think are important to look at, and I'll, I'll reference statistics throughout the presentation just to bring some numbers together with, with kind of what I'm saying in the, in the context. Um, the probability of selling to an existing customer is as high as 70%. What does that mean? You need to cater to and communicate regularly and constantly with your existing customers. It's the old 80-20 rule, and I'll talk a little bit more about that in just a moment. The probability of selling to a brand new customer can be as low as 5%. It's somewhere in the ballpark of 5 to 20% depending on what type of retailer you are. So the whole idea is once you've got somebody in your four walls or even online, ensuring that you've created a unique identif uh, identity for that individual and that you build a profile um, for those folks over time. Uh, and I'll talk a little bit more about the user profiles in just a minute. Existing customers are also 50% more likely to try new products. So if you have a new product or new category introduction, whether that's something that you're just doing internally that's self-funded or if it's something that's being funded by a vendor or partner or wholesaler partner, those folks who are already in your system are 50% more likely to try it. And I would argue it's closer to 70 or 80% if it's a personalized offer for someone who's already purchased a like product or product by that same vendor or brand. And existing customers also spend 31% more on average than new customers. Your most loyal customers, and we see this all the time with our retailers, are spending close to 2x or 100% more than the folks who are not enrolled in the program. Let's talk a little bit about bridging the gap between loyalty and personalized marketing. And at this point, I want to take a quick poll do you have a loyalty program? So regardless of what kind of retailer you are, do you have some sort of loyalty program? I see the responses coming in now. Great. I'll let those keep coming in. Give it two more seconds. 
and then I'll close the poll. Three, two, one. Thank you very much for that. Customer identification via loyalty is the key to personalization. What do I mean by that? When we put a loyalty and rewards program in a retailer, or when a retailer takes that step and chooses to put in place a rewards program, it essentially acts as the Trojan horse to get your shoppers more engaged with you as a retailer. It's all about getting them to self-identify at the checkout so that you know who that shopper is and continue to build that broad-based profile on that shopper. You're then starting to connect the individual with the SKU level detail on each and every one of their transactions and visits. You're also allowing the shopper to earn something with every transaction, with every, with every visit, essentially gamifying their shopping experience. And as we all know, Americans, we like to accumulate stuff. Uh, and I know there's folks on here from about 19 different uh, countries, which is pretty cool. And I don't know if your shoppers have the same behavior, um, but we'd like to accumulate points. We like to collect things and gamify the experience. Building the shopper profile is key. I need to understand each and every shopper's preferences. I need to understand their patterns. This is what ultimately will allow the machine learning and artificial intelligence to go to work and do what it does best. The more data I can feed the brain, the more responsive and personalized the brain's output will be. I need to understand brand affinities. I need to understand category engagement. I need to understand visit cadence and uh, average transaction value and lifetime, lifetime value of the shopper. I need to understand what their household looks like, and I can usually tell that by the cart contents. I need to understand whether or not they've got healthy and organic choices that they're making and lifestyle that they're taking on, whether they have pets, babies, etc. This is one of the first steps in allowing me to start to create customer cohorts and putting my shoppers into segments that I can later target to drive new behavior. The simple fact is that shoppers prefer loyalty programs that personalize their offers. They prefer personalization, period, as we've discussed since I started the conversation. 93% of shoppers who sign up for loyalty programs say special promotions influence their decision to join, which means when you advertise your program, a, you need to push it to every one of your touch points. You need to communicate to your shoppers on social media, in store, online, in your weekly ads, and every other touch point that you might have, email, text messaging, etc., that you've got this program, your cashiers are well versed on it, they're communicating to the shopper on a regular basis, and they're letting them know if you join, you'll have access to special personalized promotions. 76% of loyalty program members enjoy personalized promotions based on past purchases. Lots of conversations you have these days, folks will say that it's creepy for you to be tying me to my past purchases. However, when you look at the other side of that, if it empowers me, the retailer, to send you a personalized offer and create a personalized experience around you each and every time you engage with us, now you see the statistics prove themselves that 76% are okay with that. They prefer that. And 80% of shoppers are willing to allow retailers to use transaction data to provide a more personalized experience, which is the same um, level of information. They want discounts. They want offers. They want to be recognized. Some of the things that we also recommend that our retailers do is get the shopper. You want to get the shopper through the entire cycle of earning and redeeming. So you can set up things like registration offers, profile completeness offers, and things of that nature to incentivize the shopper further to give you more information and to get registered in the first place. You want to ensure that you're not spammy about it. This is what they, 
So these three stats show you what they love, and I can tell you a little bit about what they don't love. Don't spam me. Don't send me irrelevant offers. Don't communicate to me multiple times a day or too many times a week. What we find, even with text message-based campaigns, as long as they're personalized, we have opt-out rates below 1%. Let's talk a little bit about advanced shopper segmentation, which I think is really, really important. So first and foremost, uh, we're going to have another poll, which is, do you know, this is for the retailers of course, do you know who your top 50 shoppers are? Can you identify your top shoppers? Great. My second question to this, and I don't have a poll set up, but what I would say is change your answer if the answer is no, which is do you have a means to communicate to that shopper directly outside of the store? So back to the 80-20 rule, which I talked about a little bit before. 80% of your revenue is typically coming from 20% of your top shoppers. So incredibly important that A, you can identify them. And I don't mean by person. Yes, it's amazing if you can go up to them, shake their hand, and welcome them back to the store. But I also mean on the back end. Can you recognize and identify them based on their purchase history and understand their basket um, and those things that they're doing on a regular basis? Who's in their house? What are their preferences? What are their priorities? What are the certain things that they're trying to achieve every time they visit your store? The top 20% of the shoppers spend 50 times more than the bottom 20%. The bottom 20% of shoppers only account for 1% of your total sales. And one thing that a lot of people don't recognize is it takes 10 new shoppers to replace one churned top shopper. And for those of you who understand either how complicated it is to acquire new customers these days, especially in brick and mortar stores, but also the cost of acquiring new shoppers, you start to really understand and think about how important those top shoppers are to you, not just to your bottom line, um, but from an overall revenue perspective, um, what it might cost you to try to replace them. And the top 20% of the shoppers spend 50 to 70% of their monthly budget in your store. So assuming you might be able to gain that additional share of wallet that could be going to a competitor, incredibly important that you understand what's in that basket, what a lookalike shopper might look like, and what opportunities there might be for you to increase share of wallet. One quote from a top CEO from a grocery retailer, if our top shoppers add just one more item per trip, the sales potential is significantly greater than with any other segment. How do you get that additional item in their basket? So one of the things that we think about um, here at AppCard is most of the folks on the phone are likely familiar with the RFM model. That's the model based on recency, when did I come last, frequency, how often do I come, and monetary spend, how much do I spend. We take that two levels further and we actually look at, in more of a 3D model, stability and profitability. Understanding stability helps you understand what departments and categories that shopper is buying in, what types of items they're buying, how much spend there is, of course, uh, and how regularly you can depend on that shopper coming back, and in what cadence. And of course, profitability is understanding those things in their basket are they cherry picking? Are they buying across different margin groups? Are they buying private label? Are they actually a profitable top shopper? Is this somebody I want to invest further in? So we create the four boxes, as you can see here, our core tiles. We've got the low spend shoppers, we've got the brand new shoppers, we've got our top shoppers, we've got our churned and at risk shoppers. And there are very specific tactics that we recommend and want to take for each of these core tiles or customer cohorts. I've mentioned this earlier, but I'll say it again. With our new shoppers, the most important thing we want to do is establish a visit cadence, a regular pattern 
of when that shopper comes to your store. If we start to try to throw deals and offers to this new shopper who we don't know a whole lot about, we could completely miss an opportunity and be feeding them the wrong information. So it's all about establishing that cadence. You could do some lightweight things like a category introduction. If you see that they're buying in you know, deli and produce, but they haven't touched meat or dairy, you can make an introductory soft offer. Low spend shoppers are folks that you want to obviously try to increase their basket. And a couple ways that you can do that is through brand switch and category introduction. So I can start to talk to those people. I see that they're visiting at a pretty regular cadence, but their spend just isn't there. So what are some other things if I look at a lookalike shopper that I can start to send to these folks to try to get them to increase share of wallet? Churned and at-risk shoppers are interesting. Do I or do I not spend a lot of money and time on my churned shoppers? So what we would argue is you need to identify early in the cycle whether or not that shopper is at risk. They're sitting on a fence and they're determining do I go left or do I go right? Do I go back to your store or do I go somewhere else? Maybe it's online, maybe it's a competitor, um, who knows what the alternative option is. So we have programs in place that are dedicated to those at-risk shoppers to try to prevent them from churning. And there's actually a pretty nice opportunity to turn them into a regular and potentially top shopper if you treat them right at the right time when they're making that key decision. This is also a good time to talk about three types of offers that you can create both in the app card platform but in general. You can have a one-off offer that just says, let me identify people that haven't been here in 30 days and send them an offer. You can do that right now. Or you can set up an automated campaign that says, anytime any shopper doesn't come to my store in 30 days, send them an offer. Have it automated. Set it and forget it. And then thirdly, you can leverage AI and machine learning, which is what we'd always recommend. This will look at each individual's shopping behavior and send them an offer to come back to the store when they break their pattern. I might come once a week, someone else might come once a month. Sending us both an offer after 30 days of lapsed visits isn't the right solution. You've already lost me. I, you're now three weeks late on sending me that We Miss You campaign, whereas the other guy, it was right on time. So using machine learning to understand each individual shopper's behavior and then having that offer triggered by a breakage in the pattern is the key to success. This is all about delivering the right message to the right shopper at the right time. If you leave with nothing else from this presentation, come away with, I need to identify my top shoppers, I need to create a unique identifier for each of my shoppers and build a profile, and it's on me to send the right message to the right shopper at the right time to personalize their experience. So this is what I was just referring to before when we're talking about identifying a break in the shopper behavior. And it's not just about visits. It could also be about someone typically buys toilet paper every 60 days and they haven't purchased it in 75 or 100 days. It's highly unlikely they stopped using toilet paper. So in all likelihood, they've gone somewhere else. How do I identify that early? How do I identify that breakage in the pattern? Or you have a shopper that typically buys from the meat department or wine department every 30 days, and I haven't seen them in 45 or 60. Same thing. Highly unlikely they stopped buying those things. Very good chance they've gone somewhere else. How do I identify that early? How do I identify that pattern breakage and send them an offer that's automatically triggered based on that behavioral change? AI allows retailers to set triggers to automatically incentivize each individual shopper to visit with a personalized offer before you lose them. It could be to total churn, it could be to churn of a department, churn of a product, or just a change of behavior and a loss of wallet share. We can also use the AI and machine learning to make personalized recommendations. We can upsell the shopper, we can look at lookalike shoppers and understand that um, you know, 
understand basket analysis, understand pivot products, and determine potential upsells and cross-sells. We can send them brand switch offers for higher margin products, or getting them into private label, or getting them to a department they've never purchased from before, increase their basket size, increase their regular visits, simply surprise and delight your top shoppers, or again, make sure you touch base with those at-risk shoppers before they churn. Leveraging machine learning and AI to do many of these things allows you to do what you do best, which is create a great customer experience in your four walls. But by collecting this information on a regular basis, building these profiles and feeding the machine so that the brain can do the work, you're establishing a digital presence, you're establishing a personalized rewards program without a lot of heavy lifting. Let's talk about some very specific ones. So we can look at personalized offers for new product launches. So YoPlate says, um, I want to send an offer to anybody that's ever bought YoPlate but has never tried my Greek yogurt, Greek yogurt product or whatever my new product is. We can very easily identify the shoppers who have purchased that product in the past or product by that brand and send them a new product intro introduction or introductory offer via text message or email. Personalized, specific, time-bound, and results-oriented. Maybe it's a brand switch. Maybe YoPlate wants to touch every shopper who's ever bought the private or national brand equivalent competitive product. We can do that too. By understanding that SKU level data tied to that shopper and having this large database collected of, of individuals who have done these different purchasing patterns, we can now create very, very specific campaigns that only target relevant shoppers. And again, you're sending the right offer to the right person at the right time. You increase redemption, you reduce churn, you reduce opt-out, and you increase sales. And of course, having the ability to report on all of this is key. So it's extremely important that you have a tool that can measure that shopper's behavior before the campaign, during the campaign, and potentially most importantly after the campaign to determine whether or not you actually made a brand switch. Did you achieve what you had set out to do or what that vendor tasked you to do? A couple other case studies, tuna brand switch. So we looked at 5,400 different shoppers who had bought product A. We introduced product B. A lot of those folks came back in the store. They would have come back in the store anyways, right? So super important that you also have the ability to create what's called a control group where you can carve out 10 or 20% of the addressable audience. Don't send them an offer, but still measure their results so you can create and manage and measure true lift of the campaign. We can report on the total revenue over the course of the campaign, how many of those folks visited, and what the true lift was. What behavior did we change? What lift did we create from this personalized offer? Increased basket size. Let's target any shopper who has spent on average 35 bucks, offer them $5 off their next trans uh, transaction if they spend $50 or more. You don't send this to everybody. If, if you sent this offer to someone who spends on average 15 bucks per transaction, the likelihood of getting them to 50 is slim to none. But if you personalize it and gear it towards solely those people who have gotten close to that level, but not all the way there, $35 or $40, now you can incentivize them to get to the next spend limit. How many did we target? How much revenue was driven? How many of those folks visited? And what percent of lift did we create? One of the other important things that we're doing here at AppCard is we've created um, a type of technology um, that is able to predict what's going to happen with your shoppers in your stores before it happens. And it's about a 95% accuracy that we're able to make these claims uh, or predictions, if you will. And we can actually tell our retailers what their next week's sales will look like in advance of that week taking place. And it takes into, consider thing, into consideration things like weather and holidays, 
sales, and things of that nature. Again, the more information, the more data we have, the better we can be in our predictive analysis. We can do the same thing on shoppers, understanding individual buying patterns, understanding when they might buy that toilet paper again, understanding when they might um, come back into the store period, and then based on those predictions, send very relevant offers, not just based on product, but also based on timeliness, which is hugely important. So now we're giving our retailers an extra leg up, if you will, uh, because they can start to really forecast product movement, customer visits, and overall sales. And with that, I think we should open it up to questions. Sure, Merrick. We've got, uh, I think, three or four questions here. Uh, number one, what are your thoughts on text message marketing versus email marketing, and how are shoppers responding? Yep. Yeah. Great question. Um, so what I usually do for this question, and I'm usually in person with, with a bunch of folks in a room, uh, I guess we could have done, you know, a poll would be nice, but if I ask you right now, if I send you a text message, what will you do? The answer that just popped in all of your heads is, I'll open it. I'll read it. If I send you an email right now, what will you do? The answer is always, well, I might read it. I might see it. I might delete it. Who knows? The fact of the matter is text messaging has become the normal. It's the normal way to get an immediate response. If, you're, if your marketing messages are personalized and relevant, your opt-out rates will be significantly lower than you might think. Our text-based marketing offers are getting less than a 1% opt-out rate. It's because we keep them highly relevant and highly targeted all about the personalization. So we find text messaging to be significantly more effective than email. And, and when I say that, I'm talking about trying to get a shopper to do something right now or in the next you know, day or so period of time. Okay. Another question, Merrick. Uh, what is the most cost-effective way of doing personalization? Sign up for AppCard. Um, so, <laughs> there you go. <laughs> uh, you teed that one up for me. So I would, I would say the lowest cost way. So number one, you need to find a way to collect shoppers' information and get them to self-identify. So whether that's through a rewards program, a, a newsletter sign up, what, whatever it is, however you can get your shopper to say, it's me, I'm here, I agree you can market to me, and I'm going to check in with you every time I'm here, you've taken step one. Now you have to figure out a way to collect all the data and tag it to that shopper so you build that profile. Once you've done that, which is step two, then you need a marketing vehicle. And it could be a text uh, service, it could be an email service, um, and you have to start to create campaigns. Again, the beauty of having something like an app card or, or someone else who does what we do is that it's all in one. It's all in one place. So as soon as that shopper signs in and identifies, their, their information is automatically added to the real-time CRM. Every single time they come back to the store and identify themselves or shop online and identify themselves, their profile is just getting more and more robust. In that same platform, you can then start to create those segment, the segmentation and the customer cohorts, target those shoppers, and again, in the same platform, create a text-based or email-based campaign. And then, of course, track the results. So finding a partner who understands those elements, who understands the importance of identifying top shoppers, identifying um, collecting real-time data, um, making the data actionable, hugely important. You can have as much data, spreadsheets, information as you want, but if you can't actually take action, if you can't build that campaign, create that segment, send that offer, report and understand the, the results, then you've missed a real opportunity. So uh, do due diligence, find the right partner, um, talk to other retailers in your circle, if you're a part of a share group, um, and get, get leads from folks in your network and, and understand who the best in class is and um, uh, go for it. But step, step one is doing the due diligence. Step two is actually signing on the dotted line and putting something in place to start collecting that information. 
Excellent. Okay, here's another interesting question. What do you think the impact of online ordering and click to collect has on grocery marketing? Great question. So right now what you see statistically is about 1.5 to 2% of revenue at a retailer with online shopping um, is coming through e-commerce. So it's a very small number in the grand scheme of things. You still have 98.5% of your revenue that is being purchased inside your four walls. However, as more and more people become comfortable with online shopping, that number is going to grow and it's going to grow quickly. We're not going back to the days of old. So anyone who thinks it might go back to the way it was, it's not. It's going in the other direction and it's going to be moving quickly. So when you think about a rewards program, when you think about personalization, you have to be omnichannel. I know a few folks have talked about this today. You have to be able to cater to your shopper at whatever touch point they choose to engage with you. Online ordering and click to collect is here to stay. It's going to mature. It's going to change. It's going to be something that we live and learn and fail a bunch and figure out. But it's going to be part of the marketing mix. It's going to be part of the grocery shopping experience. So ensuring that whatever programs you put in place can cater to that shopper wherever they choose to shop with you is hugely important. Building a foundation today that puts you in a position to win tomorrow when all these things really start to change and you're up to 20% of your revenue coming online is incredibly important. Picking partners who are technology first companies that understand the need to have APIs and to be able to work you know, work nicely in the sandbox with other providers is hugely important. Finding someone who's going to, you know, tighten you in a box and not allow you to work well with others as you start to add click and collect in e-commerce and uh, mobile commerce and all these different features and benefits to your shopper is going to be detrimental. So um, that's how I that's how I would think about it. Okay. Another question: How does social media play into a personalized marketing effort? That's a good question. So I'm not a social media expert. Um, I don't even have Facebook anymore, believe it or not, but I do have Instagram. Um, we work with a lot of folks who do social media. And from everything that we hear, um, you know, I'll, I'll talk about Facebook advertising for a second. Um, when you talk about Facebook advertising, you do have the opportunity to target people very specifically based on other pages they've liked, where they live, other uh, assets within their demographics um, or features within their demographics, etc. So you do have the ability to personalize your offers um, and your, the way in which you present yourself um, to acquire new folks uh, in social media. The way I would say um, that you want to use it for ongoing personalization, and I don't know that you can you know, personalize each message that you send out if you're just posting something on one of your pages. Um, you know, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, Pinterest, etc. However, ensuring that you're promoting your programs on those social media channels is extremely important. And doing it in a tasteful way that is kind of built and designed for that specific channel. Um, we see the most success with our retailers who promote the program online, on their website, in social media, targeted online ads, targeted Facebook ads, in-store, from the rafters, on the windows, on the shelves, um, and anywhere else that shopper might experience that retailer. So really making sure that all of your touch points, if you will, are consistent, clear in the communication, and talking about ways in which your shopper can engage with you is the way I would leverage social media today. Excellent. Okay, last question. For the retailers you work with, does the 80-20 rule apply, meaning 20% of top shoppers account for 80% of total store sales? 100%. No pun intended. Um, yes. That it, you just can't escape the 80-20 rule as many times as you might try to slice and dice the data. Um, and again, why, why I spent so much time and even created a poll around, can you identify your top shoppers? If you can't, you are in trouble. You have to be able to identify your top shopper. You have to have a way to communicate with your top shopper. If you lose your top shoppers, it's extraordinarily 
difficult to A, win them back, but B, to replace them with 10 new shoppers. So having a vehicle in place where you can identify them, send them a surprise and delight, send them a thank you, maybe even notify someone in, in lane when they're there, um, it's critical. It's paramount. Um, and I, the 80-20 rule, again, you just can't escape it. It's, uh, it's fact. Okay, excellent. Thank you very much. There was uh, a lot of questions, which always uh, speaks to a good presentation. It was full of great information. Thank you very much. And if you'd like more information, you can uh, contact Merrick directly. His phone number and email is on the screen right now. Again, congratulations. That was a great, great presentation full of great information. Thank you. Thank you.